so many have not heard about the story of Jesus. And Lord, help us to renew our efforts, our commitment, to make sure that we're following the Great Commission to spread the story of Jesus throughout the world. Lord, there are many who have come, front, uh, come up front today uh, with concerns, some praises, but some special requests to bring before your throne of grace. And Lord, you know what they are. You know our hearts. We bring them before you because we know that you can not only hear our prayers, but you can answer them in your way and in your time. So, Lord, we ask for comfort. We do ask for healing. We do ask for your spirit, Lord, in a very special way to be poured out upon each member of the church here, those locally as well as those watching from afar. Forgive us of our sins, Lord, where we are weak and we have fallen short. Uh, there are so many different ways, Lord, that we have uh, stumbled. And, Lord, we know because of the blood of the Lamb that you have uh, made appropriation for our sins already in advance. So help us to believe in, a, in, a, in your son Jesus and what his life, death, and resurrection truly mean for each and every one of us. Lord, we pray in a special way for your humble servant, Pastor Doug, here, as he brings us a special message today. I will anoint your humble servant and prepare our hearts and minds for this message today as well as the ones through this afternoon. Also, um, for the... Um, for the... A wonderful service that we will have at the end of the day, the foot washing. Thank you again, Lord, for listening to our prayers. We know you are coming very soon. Help to divorce us from this world. Help us to have the faith of Jesus to completely and fully rely on you on all things. And we love you, Lord. Thank you for all that you do for us. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Welcome, friends. We're so glad to see each of you here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. And I'm just curious, are there any that are here maybe for the first time today? Can we see your hands? Bless your hearts. You are now part of the family. And we hope it is habit forming. We're glad to have you here today. And we know that there are people that are watching online. I want to welcome any who may be tuning in on AFTV or the Amazing Facts YouTube, Facebook channels and just wherever you happen to be. Uh, a matter of fact, I heard last night that there is a church in Bakersfield, the Bakersfield Central Church, that has basically cleaned the slate so they can watch this program with us today. So I think we're surprising them by telling them hello. God bless you. And we welcome you to the special series, I think you understand the time of year, where we're talking about the glory of the cross from the upper room through the tomb. And I've been listening to the presentations by Pastor Aaron, Pastor Rador today, and I'll be taking it up. Uh, you all pray for me because uh, it's not an overstatement to say that we are on holy ground. I've titled the message, The Crucifixion, A Cosmic Singularity. And you might think, Pastor Doug, that sounds strange. What is that? Well, according to Merriam-Webster, a singularity is a point or a region in infinite mass, or infinite mass density at which space and time are infinitely distorted by gravitational forces and which is held to be the final state of matter falling into a black hole where the rules of time and space no longer apply. A singularity. It's talking about a, a moment that transforms everything. If you're in computers, when they talk about a singularity in AI, they say when we reach that point in time where computers are programming themselves to think independently, that would be the computer singularity. Of course, the singularity cosmically is when you find the focal point of a black hole. 
And the singularity that I'm talking about is the cross. Because what's happening at the cross is there is a train wreck in all of history. Christ and good and love collide with the devil, selfishness, and evil. And it's a head-on collision. You see all of this at the cross. Fortunately, only the heel was bruised of Jesus, but the head was crushed of the serpent. But there was a titanic battle at the cross. And if history was a wheel and you asked where the axle was, where all of it revolves, the crucifixion is the singularity where you see demonstrated the ultimate love of God and the devil's power of our love for power. And there's this great contest that's transpiring there for the fate of the universe. And so um, I'll tell you right now, I'm just going to relax and accept the truth that there's no way in the world that I will have enough time to cover what this is dealing with. I was going through the different points, and just in case you're wondering, I've divided my message up into the seven segments of his suffering and seven statements from the cross. And uh, unless I could pray and make the sun stop still or stand still, I just don't know how each one of them is a sermon. And I'm sure all of my fellow presenters are battling with the same thing. There is so much in the story of the cross. But we're going to begin where Brother Rodor left off with the trial. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to where we see the sentence, where Christ is sentenced by Pilate. You know, of course, he went from the trial with Annas and Caiaphas, then to Pilate, then to Herod, back to Pilate. And you read in Matthew 27, verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather a tumult was rising, he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. You've heard the expression before, well, I'm washing my hands of it. It means I'm not taking responsibility. It comes from this story. Turn in your Bibles then to the next passage is Luke 23, 13. And uh, this will be the longest section we'll read uh, in this part, Luke chapter 23, verse 13. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, he said to them, You brought me this man as one who misleads the people, and indeed I've examined him in your presence. I've found no fault in this man. No fault. Concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod. For he sent you, I sent you to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Nothing. I will therefore chastise him and release him. You're wondering if he's done nothing, why is he going to chastise him? That's, you're looking for a political compromise there. For it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried at once, saying, Away with this man, release to us Barabbas who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. In another chapter it says that he was also a thief. So they prefer a murderer and a rebel and a thief to Jesus. By the way, the word Barabbas, Bar means son of Abba, father. He is son of the father. He's almost like a counterfeit Messiah. He was going to use brute force and rebellion to try to overthrow the Romans and it was so different from Jesus. That's the kind of Messiah they wanted. He offered them Barabbas. And you look at the two, and you know, Barabbas is clearly a hardened criminal with a record of sin, and Jesus is majestic and pure, and the world calls for Barabbas. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus again, he called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Then he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priests persisted and prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one that they had requested, Barabbas, 
who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Jesus was delivered to the will of the mob. When the mob came to arrest him in the garden is when he began suffering for our sins. And they got a mob at every trial and a mob at Herod's, and these individuals were filled with the demons that were venting their fury on the Son of God. And the father did not intervene at this point to protect his son. So not only do you see the love of God at the cross, you see God's hatred for sin. You see the wrath of God because the wrath of God really was poured on Jesus, the wrath that belongs to us for sin. He took. And he was separated from the Father during that time. So you have the sentence. Then next, you've got the scourging and the crown of thorns. Mark 15, 15 so Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them and delivered Jesus after he had scourged him. Now, scourby, scourging is not just like whipping someone with a Western bullwhip. It's got one end on it. The Roman scourge, uh, it was actually like a cat of nine tails. There are usually but three uh, tongs on the end of it, maybe five, and they would tie or beat pieces of metal or bone into these straps they would take the victim, they tie their hands together around a pillar that was designed for this purpose so they could not escape, and then one or two Roman guards would then begin to whip the back and the back of the legs of the individual, not just creating welts, but often tearing the flesh. And this is a whipping, not just as a punishment, but a whipping preparation for death. And so uh, it was just a horrible scene you know, um, a few years ago, this time of year, I was with Amazing Facts in the Philippines. Matter of fact, uh, Brian, who's out here somewhere, was with me. And uh, I was doing an evangelistic meeting, but it just happened to be Easter. And we got word, they said, you know, in the Philippines, they actually reenact the crucifixion in this region, about 40 miles outside of Manila. It's Pampana or Pamgo, I forget. Some of you might know. But um, we went. I think Nathan was with me that day. He's kind of wishing he didn't go. For one thing, it was like three hours of traffic each way. But um, the people go down the streets. Officially, the Catholic Church frowns on this, but they don't really stop it. And people flog themselves with these whips that have many tongs on them, and they are bleeding. We were doing a documentary on Revelation that actually this would fit into it, and our, Brian trying to get some footage of this, actually at one point blood splattered on the lens. It, it's very visceral. And all these people gather around, and they're watching people who are literally being crucified. Now, I can tell you, I have seen someone be crucified. And I had real mixed feelings about going. I thought, well, you know, this footage, it may be valuable for the documentary, but people are all standing around. These individuals volunteer to be crucified. They nail them to a cross. But there's vendors around selling t-shirts, and there's a grandstand, and public officials are there, and the Catholic Church officially doesn't support it, but the Jesuits were there. And um, they got prime seating, and then they put microphones on the people that are going to be crucified. Some of them have been crucified many times. And um, I, I just, I'll never forget, even though all of this was a recreation and they didn't leave them up long and they were, the nails were stainless steel sanitized. And I mean, you know, they try to modernize it and make it as safe as possible. But still, the moment when you saw them drive a nail in a man's hands and he screamed in pain, it made the crucifixion very real. And seeing those people whip themselves. What the Romans did to Jesus was much worse. And then they braided a crown of thorns. You can read about that in John 19.2. The soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and they put it on him, on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Now one place you're going to see, it'll say a scarlet robe. Another place in the Gospels it says a purple robe. In another place it says a gorgeous robe. It was scarlet and purple, which were considered royal robes, which by the way are the colors that are being worn by the woman in Revelation 17. Jesus became a king of sin 
for us. And it says, with his stripes we are healed. The stripes is the marks left on the back when a person is flogged that way. And the thorns, of course, they first appeared when Adam and Eve sinned. Thorns and thistles appeared, all a symbol of sin. He became the king of sin for you and me. He took the penalty for all of our sins willingly, which is hard to comprehend. He took the curse. So you've got the sentence, the scourging, then you have the substitute. On the way to the cross, he begins bearing the cross himself. You can find that there in John 19, 17. And bearing his cross, he went forth to the place called by the place of the skull, which in the Hebrew is Golgotha. But then you read in Mark 15, 21, then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian. Uh, the Cyrenians were from a, a district near Libya in northern Africa, and they had Jewish settlements all around the Mediterranean and the Roman Empire. And uh, one tradition says that this was an African Jew that had come to Jerusalem for the feast. And it may be because there's a place in the scriptures where it talks about one of the church leaders who was called Simon Niger, which means Simon the Black. And it says here that he's the father of Rufus. The, so they clearly knew who this person was after the event, the father of Alexander and Rufus. As he was coming out of the country and passing by, they grabbed him. They said, you look like you're strong enough. And they forced him to bear the cross because Jesus, you think about it, he hadn't eaten in nearly 24 hours and hadn't had anything to drink. There's no record that uh, Pilate or Herod or the trial with the priests, they offered him anything to drink. He's now been flogged. He's exhausted. He's bearing the weight of the sins, the separation from the Father. Then they put this very heavy burden on his back and he ultimately, humanity just can't do it. He faints under it. And they think, well, we've got to get him to the place of execution. And the Romans, they could then compel you. You know where Jesus said, if any man compels you to go a mile, go two. The Roman soldiers used to take farmers out of the field and say, carry our gear for a mile. The Christians would say, I'll carry it too. And then the Romans say, why? You'd say, because I'm a Christian. So Jesus fell. Simon takes the cross. He later learns more about what has happened, the significance of it. You can read in the book, Desire of Ages, that classic on the life of Christ. Bearing the cross to Calvary was a blessing to Simon and he was ever grateful for this providence. It led him to take upon himself the cross of Christ from choice and ever cheerfully stand beneath its burden. You and I, like Simon, are invited to take up our cross and follow Jesus. And that means we take it to our crucifixion. Some of us think, oh, if I could have been there that day, I would have been glad to bear his cross. Well, you are invited right now says, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself. Take up your cross. A.W. Tozer says, the man with a cross no longer controls his destiny. He lost control when he picked up his cross. That cross immediately became to him an all-absorbing interest, an overwhelming interference. No matter what he might desire to do, there's one thing he can do, and that is to move on towards the place of crucifixion. When you take up your cross, you're going to your crucifixion. That's why Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. That's why Paul said, I die daily. Every day when we're tempted, I have to say, I'm crucifying the old Doug. I'm going to follow Jesus. Then you have the sympathy. The sympathy. You read in Luke 23, verse 27, there followed him a great company of people and women who also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them, he said, daughters of Jerusalem. Now Christ is speaking, and he's speaking a prophecy. Do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. For indeed the days are coming, in which they will say, blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they'll begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? When Christ was there and the Spirit was moving among his people, what would happen when Jesus was gone and the Spirit removed? And he's talking here about two things. 
the destruction of Jerusalem that would come to that generation and a repeat of that in the last days when the Holy Spirit is withdrawn. It's amazing. Although full of suffering while bearing the sins of the world, he was not indifferent to the expression of grief. He looked upon these women with tender compassion. Now, if I was going through what Jesus was going through, I wouldn't be thinking a lot about other people's feelings. This is one reason you can just see the power of God's love, is that even when he was going through intense suffering, he was sensitive to the feelings and the destiny of others. Then you have the sacrifice. Matthew 27, verse 35. Then they crucified him. What's that? Four words? It's, you almost feel like, can't that be longer? And, and I think it's because we don't understand. It happened so frequently in the Roman Empire. Crucifixion, it goes all the way, all the way back to the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And then it was adopted by the Persians. And Alexander the Great, he learned about it from the Persians. And he brought it to the Mediterranean, where it was adopted by the Romans. And it became the favored method of execution of criminals to discourage disobedience. And it was effective. There was 40 years during the life of Christ, uh, during the reign, of, I should say, of Augustus Caesar, called the, Ro the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. They wanted peace in the empire, and they used crucifixion to discourage any crime. But it was an agonizing way to die, where you would take a, either a cross, or a person was hanged on a T-like cross. It might even be a stake. The Jehovah Witnesses make a big deal out of that. But some were crucified on a stake. It's true. Jesus died on a cross. Pastor Doug, how do you know? Because he said to John, that I said to Peter, when you were young, you dressed yourself and you went where you would, but when you are old, another will gird you and you will stretch forth your hands. And the way that's worded, stretch forth, is like this or like this. It's not over your head. Christ died on a cross. The scriptures are very clear. And they would nail the hands and the feet. And uh, sometimes a person might be tied. Jesus was nailed. The Bible's very clear. And it was, the whole idea was to exact the maximum amount of suffering from someone before they died and humiliation. They would strip them. They put them in a public place where everybody could see. You can read about the crucifixion during the rebellion of Spartacus. That was before the time of Christ. Thousands of slaves were crucified around Rome. And you can read about the crucifixions during the fall of Jerusalem. Josephus said you could not find a tree for miles around Jerusalem because they had all been cut down to crucify the rebels in the city. So it was very common. That's why they said they crucified him. But it's hard for us to embrace the, the suffering that would be involved in that. And for Jesus, the hardest part, I'm certain, was not the physical suffering. And, I don't even like thinking about that. The idea that for the first time in eternity he was separated, God the Father and God the Son were separated. Another reason it's a cosmic singularity that had never happened before, that time when they were separated because of our sin. He was separated from his Father, so we do not need to be eternally separated. That's good news. I know the gospel is, the cross in particular is a, it's a, a paradox because it is such sad news and it is such good news and you see so much evil in the mob and the, the filth and the blood and, and yet you see so much good in what Jesus is doing in the way that he's giving. There they crucified him and they divided his garments casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. You know, crucifixion involved the nails in the hands. Jesus had nails in his feet. He was pierced in his head, his back, ultimately his side. The Bible tells us the mark of the beast is in the hand or in the forehead. In the hand means in your actions. The nails in his hand is for our bad actions. The feet in the Bible represent where you go. 
your direction. That's why we have foot washing. We go places we shouldn't go. The direction of our life is often sinful. He was nailed in his feet. He had the thorns in his head because we all know we think things we shouldn't think. And he suffered for the motives and the thoughts of the heart that are sinful. And then by his heart, his side was pierced. A separate flow of blood and water came out. And, of course, this is representing our hearts are wrong. Our hearts are bad. Our hearts are broken. His heart became broken so our hearts could be made new. He said, I will put a new heart within you. Amen? Amen. And he was whipped on his back. Our back is a place where we bury, we carry burdens, and, and we bear the wrong burdens. We're laden down with the things of this life. So you've got the the sympathy and the sacrifice, now the sign above his head. And you find this in all four Gospels, and some people are perplexed. You read in Matthew, then they put over his head an accusation written against him, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mark puts it this way, the King of the Jews. Luke says, this is the King of the Jews. John says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And Bible critics love to point to that and say, you can't trust the Bible. In something as basic as the sign above his head, all gospel writers are different. Well, the differences are minute, but they forget that John says it was written in three languages. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they just sort of picked the way it was worded in the three languages. It all said the same thing. Amen? The thing that's interesting about that story is Pilate that has been spineless through all of this. Finally, the religious leaders, when he's crucified and they see the Romans nailing the sign above his head, it doesn't say he claimed to be the king of the Jews. It says, this is the king of the Jews. And I think Pilate, you know, he came to Jesus. He said, are you a king? Jesus did not deny it. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. He's basically admitting he's a king. And the religious leaders went storming into Pilate and they said, change that sign. Everyone coming to the feast of Passover says, this is the king of Jews and you're making it look like we've killed our king. And Pilate finally grows a backbone and he said, what I have written, I have written. He is disgusted with himself already for what he has done. Pilate will ultimately commit suicide in Spain. He was tormented the rest of his life. The dreams of his wife warned him, have nothing to do with that just man. Jesus came first as a lamb. He will come later as a lion. Then you've got the soldiers. John 19, 23 and 24. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts. Now, the garments of Christ would represent righteousness. The Bible talks about he'll send his angels to the four corners of the earth. Four. There are four angels holding back the four winds of strife. It means north, south, east, west. That means that the sacrifice of Christ and the righteousness of Christ is universal in its ability to save everybody. It doesn't matter what part of the compass you live in. They divided his garments in four parts. But his outer tunic was made without seam. Now the seam is, you know, you can look at the seam in clothes. You can kind of find out where the starting point is and where the ending point is. To have a garment without seam is eternal. It's also like there's no flaw representing the righteousness of Christ. And even though it was a blood-stained robe, which, by the way, is what covers our sin, even though it was a blood-stained robe, they said, it's too good. We can wash it. And so they gambled to see who would get it, fulfilling the prophecy that said that they would gamble. Psalm 22, they'll cast lots for my raiment. Well, there you've got the seven segments now we come to the seven statements of Jesus. There are seven things that Jesus says from the time of the crucifixion uh, until the resurrection. First one, now these are mostly in order, but there's a couple places it, it may have uh, be out of order. Father, forgive them. You look in your Bibles in Luke 23, verse 34. As he's being crucified, he prays for his tormentors. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Now, Jesus puts a big priority on forgiveness. Even at the time of his 
crucifixion, he's thinking about the people needing forgiveness. At the beginning of his crucifixion, he's thinking about the forgiveness of others. Now, you notice when it came to Judas, he said it would have been better for that man if he had not been born because he knew what he was doing. He saw the miracles. He knew who Jesus was. But these involved in the execution, like Paul, who was later converted after stoning Stephen, he never could forget his part. He played in that, and it tormented him. Can you imagine if any of these soldiers, or like the centurion who ultimately declared, surely this was the Son of God, to think, I was there participating in his execution. But Jesus prayed for them because they didn't know. And by the way, you were there when they crucified my Lord. You were. There's a country song that says, while he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And uh, he did it for you. You might be thinking, how could he do that? Well, how does he hear your prayers? Jesus looked down through time and he was suffering for your sins. Every sin you have committed and those you may potentially commit. He took it all in himself on the cross. Amen? Amen. Father, forgive them. Jesus makes one commentary on the Lord's Prayer. You know what it is? Remember it says in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then after the prayer is over, Jesus then says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Now Christ is not saying that we forgive first. He forgives first. But after you have embraced His forgiveness, He wants you to have a forgiving spirit and be willing to forgive others. Now don't misunderstand. Forgiving others doesn't mean you need to let everybody abuse you all the time. But you need to let it go. Some people go through life and they're bitter and they're unforgiving. Colossians 3.13, forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. God is not encouraging. He is commanding us to forgive. I mean, have you ever been crucified? Jesus is praying for the forgiveness of the ones that are crucifying him. Just like Stephen when he was being stoned. What does he say? Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He prays for his persecutors. And doesn't Jesus say, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you that you might be the children of your Father in heaven. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. This is only possible with the love of God. You can't do that. But if you've got God's spirit and the mind of Christ in you, you can love those that hate you. You don't ever convert anybody by hating them back. You convert them by turning the other cheek. You're heaping coals of fire on their head when you do good to those that are bad to you. Then the second statement, he says, Woman, behold your son. As he's hanging from the cross, not only does he demonstrate love for the people that are crucifying him, he's thinking about his mother. <clears throat> Jesus is looking out there, and when he first is being crucified, I believe Mary faints. Pardon me. <clears throat> she faints, and um, she's born away, but he's on the cross for six hours. Jesus, seven hours really, he's on the cross six hours alive, you do the math, from nine o'clock to three o'clock, and then he's on the cross another hour resting, seven hours total on the cross, while his body is being retrieved and taken to the tomb. Isn't that interesting? But then Mary is brought when the crowd gets tired of their mocking and their taunting, and he sees his mother standing there at the foot of the cross, and he looks down with the sweat burning in his eyes, and he says, woman, behold your son. And he nods towards John. Why that? Why John? And not one of Jesus' stepbrothers. Well, that's the point. The brothers of Jesus were probably stepbrothers from Joseph's first marriage. Um, I know some people, they, they think, what? No, Jesus was, I think, the only child that Mary had. Let me give you three reasons for that. First of all, Joseph was older than Mary. You notice when Jesus begins his ministry, Joseph's gone. You never see him appear again in the story. The last time you hear from Joseph, Jesus is 12 years old. And he lived longer than that because it says he grew up, he was subject to his parents. But by the time Christ began his ministry, Joseph is older. 
The other thing is it would have been very unusual for the firstborn son to leave the family business and become an itinerant preacher. That would have been considered disrespectful. A firstborn son was the one who was supposed to mind things at home. By the way, James was the oldest who wrote the book of James. The other thing is that um, why would he give his son, if Mary has four other sons and at least two daughters, because it says Jesus has sisters and brothers, why would he commit the care to an apostle? But it's because, first of all, the love relationship. He just loved John and James, in particular. John always refers to himself as the one Jesus loved, and he commended the care of his mother to this apostle. Now think about that. The last will and testament of Jesus his robe is given to his executors and he cares for his mother. Honor your father and mother right to the end. He shows love once again. I, I think there's more here also when he says, woman, behold your son. If you go to Revelation 12, it tells about this woman that's great with child and the dragon wants to devour her man child as soon as it is born. That woman with 12 stars above her head. Who is she? Church. Who is the man child? Jesus, he's caught up to God's throne. You with me? This is plain, old-fashioned theology. It's very basic. So when Jesus says, woman, behold thy son, it's really a greater appeal. Christ said, if I am lifted up, Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent, we look and we live. Amen? It's an appeal for you. Woman, behold your son. You see his love for you. You see what sin does. And this is what happens to us if we don't repent of our sins. There's something transformational in looking and living. Woman, behold your son. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. How do we lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily besets us? He says, looking unto Jesus. We run that race. Amen? Amen. Then Jesus is on the cross. And it says, one of the thieves says to him, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and us. But the other thief, and by the way, you're only going to find this in Luke chapter 23. The other writers don't mention this very interesting exchange. The other thief answers his companion. He said, do you not fear God seeing that we are in the same condemnation? Don't join others in mocking him by saying, if you're the Son of God. He says, this man has done nothing wrong. See, these thieves were standing there when they heard Pilate say, because they were getting ready to be executed with Barabbas. And Barabbas got pulled out and Jesus got Barabbas' cross. By the way, you and I are Barabbas. Jesus took our cross. Right? So this other thief is hearing that whole exchange. I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. He's done nothing wrong. And he remembers what he's heard about Jesus. And he looks, you know, your mind is accelerated when you're dying with adrenaline. He looks above the cross and he sees this is the king of the Jews. Then he looks at the bottom and he sees them gambling. And he hears Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's Psalm 22. And then you go to the end of that Psalm, it says they cast lots for my garments. And all this is racing through his mind and whatever he learned as a boy in the synagogue. And suddenly the Holy Spirit quickens his mind. He says, John the Baptist said this was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I need a lamb right now to forgive my sins. It was a miracle. The Holy Spirit quickened his mind in the 11th hour. And in Jesus, just think about the faith. I mean, Jesus does not look like a Lord right now. He's, he's beaten and he's naked. He's condemned. He's being mocked. It's ugly. But he looks at him and he not only says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What are you implying when you say someone has a kingdom? They're a king. He says, Lord, king, remember me. That was the only one around the cross that day that bore witness to who Jesus was and what he was doing. Amen. You know why? Because it's the, it's the ultimate example of what he can do to save us. All of us here are like one of those two thieves. They were two thieves. They were both condemned. One on the right, one on the left, like the sheep and the goats someday. They could do nothing to save themselves. And they were probably accused of the same crimes as Barabbas, rebels, thieves, murder. 
We are guilty of the murder of God's Son. We've rebelled against God and His law. We've stolen the time and the means that God has given to us for blessing others. And we live selfish lives. And here we are now. We're under a death sentence. We can do nothing to save ourselves like those thieves. And one of them says, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, remember me. And you know, the devil thought that by crucifying Jesus, he was going to stop his work of saving humanity. Even though Jesus' hands were nailed to the cross, the devil could not keep the Savior from saving. Jesus spoke. He, he forgot his own suffering. The clouds parted, I think, and the sun shone through as Jesus did what he came to do. He says, I have come to seek and save those that are lost. And in the 11th hour of that man's life, he said, you, I'm telling you today, verily I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And I think peace rested on that man's soul. Now, all of us are in the crowd there somewhere. All of us are condemned. We're all dying. Are we the one that's going to reach out and ask for help? Now, I just got to say this. Don't say within yourself, well, Jesus can save me in the 11th hour of my life. So I'm just going to live for the world and the devil, and I'm going to play Russian roulette with eternity, and in the 11th hour, I will turn to Jesus. I like what Matthew Henry said. There is one example of a deathbed conversion in the Bible, so no one needs to lose hope. But there's only one example, so no one dare presume. A lot of people I know, that uh, they think that, yeah, when that day comes, I'm going to then repent. They either destroy their minds with drugs or alcohol, they lose their capacity to repent, they die instantly. So don't, don't gamble with eternity thinking, I'll wait till the 11th hour. Right now is the day, the time to accept Jesus. Amen? Amen. He said, assuredly I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. And this also fulfilled the prophecy in Isaiah. It says in chapter 53, he was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus is crucified right between a thief on the right and the left. Then you have his statement, my God, my God. Matthew 27, verse 46, about the ninth hour, this is near the end, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, don't think, please, for a moment, that Jesus couldn't take it anymore, and he got discouraged, and he wondered, why is this happening? Jesus was not wondering what was happening. He had told his disciples over and over again, I'm going to Jerusalem, I will be betrayed, and I'm going to be put over in the hands of sinners, they'll crucify me, I will rise the third day. He knew, it was like, seven, eight times in the Gospels where he told exactly what was going to happen. He said, for this cause I've come into the world. In the garden he prayed that the cup might be taken away because he knew. He told the disciples, are you able to drink my cup? He knew. So for him to say why, but you know, sometimes God asks questions, they're rhetorical questions. Like when God says to Adam, where are you? Where has sin gotten you? When Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you realize he's quoting scripture? He's quoting the first line in Psalm 22. Why is Jesus quoting this psalm and asking what would be a rhetorical question? Look in Psalm 22, verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. They stare at me. He's anyone who knew that psalm when he quoted the first verses, they read on, they go, whoa, it's being fulfilled right now. He was directing their attention to one of the most obvious messianic prophecies that told about his sufferings. Jesus did not get discouraged. It says regarding the Messiah, he will not be discouraged. And discouragement can be a sin. But did he feel the separation of the Father? Yes. Did he know why? Yes. Because he was bearing our sins. Isn't it interesting that when the devil met him in the wilderness, Christ quoted Scripture. And when the devil met him at the cross, Christ quoted Scripture. When you're going through trial, quote Scripture. Amen. Then he says in verse 5, 
I thirst. Now, this is all happening quickly near the end. He's been there for six hours. John 19, 28, after this, Jesus, knowing, notice what John says, knowing that all things were now accomplished. Did Jesus know what was going on? Amen. That the scripture might be fulfilled. What scripture? Wait for it. It's coming. He said, I thirst. What scripture? Psalm 42, 2. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? The Bible tells us in the book of Job, he says, my tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. Jesus is thirsting here, and it says that in his thirst they gave him gall to drink. You can read here in Matthew chapter 27, verse 34. They gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. It's got kind a of drug, and it was supposed to deaden some of the pain but when he tasted it, he would not drink. Psalm 69, verse 20, another messianic psalm. Reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. They dipped the Romans, would sometimes have a little mercy on those that were dying of crucifixion to prolong it. They would dip a sponge in a long reed or pole, they'd dip it into some vinegar and they'd hold it up to their lips so they could suck on it and get a little bit of relief. And they gave him this concoction to drink. This is exactly what was foretold. The sixth statement that Jesus makes. John 19, verse 30. So when Jesus received the sour wine, he said it is finished. So, it says that the prophecy might be fulfilled. Do you know what the prophecy was? I just read you three of them. So when Jesus received the sour wine, no wait, there's one more very important thing I'm forgetting. What was the first miracle of Jesus? John chapter 2, he turns water into wine. Was it 90 proof wine or was it grape juice? It was grape juice. Jesus didn't make a bunch of booze for a party. It was pure grape juice that represented his blood. That's why they said, you save the best for last. They, they, you could only get the pure grape juice during the harvest. And they're thinking, where do you get this in the springtime? And so uh, they said, you save the best for last. The miracle, first thing that happens is Jesus gives to us pure grape juice. Is that the Last Supper? Was it fermented? Unleavened bread unfermented grape juice. Jesus said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you new in the Father's kingdom. New wine. New wine has no alcohol. So it's the new wine he gives us. What do we give him on the cross? Last thing that happens, he takes sour wine. This is basically a blood transfusion that's happening here. Jesus gives us the good and he takes our bad. Do you see that, friends? Say Amen. And then his sixth statement, which is sort of coupled with the seventh, John 19, verse 30. So when Jesus perceived the sour wine, he said, it is finished. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And the word when he said finished there is a word in Greek, teleleo. It means Paid in full. The debt is paid. Jesus knew that he had borne the wrath of the Father. He had borne the penalty for our sins. He knew that his moment was coming. You know, they would sometimes last for days on the cross, but concentrated like a magnifying glass taking the sun and focusing into one point. All the wrath of God was focused on Jesus at that point. He had taken it all in. He'd suffered for the sins of the world. You and I can't barely suffer for our own sins or for someone else's sins, but he was able to suffer for all sin there. And he knew it was finished. The debt was paid in full. The money's in the bank. question is, will you cash the check? And then, seventh statement, when Jesus cried out with a loud voice, what did he say with a loud voice? You notice it says when he said, I thirst, he says it with a loud voice. This is very unusual because people dying of crucifixion, they're being asphyxiated. 
they're hanging, and when they push up on their feet, it's excruciating, by the way. You know where the word excruciating comes from? It's drawn from the word crucify, excruciating pain. When you can't find any word that's stronger to explain pain, you say excruciating. It's the pain that Jesus suffered on the cross. And when he would push down on his feet to try to raise himself up to take a lung full of air, it was terrible, terribly painful, and your breaths become more and more shallow. But here he calls out with a loud cry. It's triumphal. It's like Samson praying between the pillars. And he says, Lord, give me my strength one more time. And he brings down the temple of Dagon. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit with a loud voice. Having said this, he breathed his last. The first recorded words of Jesus were, I must be about my father's business. The last recorded words of Jesus are, Father, into your hands. Everything about Jesus was to come and to do the father's will. Amen? Amen. Now, I need to ask these important questions. Why was he crucified? You need to understand. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered to you first all that I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Again, Romans 5, 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Any ungodly out there? Any sinners? But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us, for every one of us. 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. Why did he die? He died for our sins that we can die to sin. Romans chapter 8. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this is why this happened 1,993 years ago and it's still just as powerful today. So what do we do if we are going to benefit from that sacrifice? How does that happen? And this is probably one of the most important parts is we need to apply it to our lives. Here are the conditions. John 3, 16. Anyone not know that? For God, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting life. What is our job? Believe in him. If someone gives you a check and you don't think it's worth anything, you're not going to cash it. But if you think it's worth something, you're going to take it to the bank. You need to say, I believe he died for my sins. I believe he will give me power. He saves us from the power of sin. Mark 1.15, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So there's repentance, sorrow for your sin. Does it move you, friends, when you see him suffer for you on the cross? It should. And you know what? Even if it doesn't move you, you ought to pray and say, Lord, take this stony heart out of my flesh. Give me a heart of flesh. Help me to see how much you love me. We love him because he first loved us. Where do we see his love? On the cross. Acts 26, verse 20, that they should repent and turn to God and do works befitting repentance. We should walk in a newness of life. And then 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Lord wants to do that for you, but you need to invite him into your heart for that purpose. You know, I want to quote by reading a brief passage from the book Desire of Ages, page 755. The spotless Son of God hung upon the cross. His flesh lacerated with stripes, those hands so often reached out in blessing, nailed to the wooden bars. Those feet so tireless on ministries of love spiked to the tree. That royal head pierced by crown of thorns. 
those quivering lips shaped to the cry of woe, and all that he endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that racked his frame, the unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face, speaks to each child of humanity, declaring, it is for thee that the Son of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. For thee he spoils the domains of death, and he opens the gates of paradise. He who stilled the angry waves and walked the foam-capped billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee, he who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead to life, offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice. And this from love to thee. So, we need to answer the question that Pilate asked the crowd. He said, what am I to do with Jesus? When they asked for Barabbas, he said, what am I to do with Jesus? And the Lord is asking you, this singularity in history of Jesus coming and all history is dated from his birth because of what happened on the cross. What are you going to do about it? Are you willing to say, Lord, I would like to ask you to be my Lord and my King. And I want to pray that you'll remember me. And I know what that means. Christ said, whoever would come after me, let him take up his cross, Luke says, daily, and deny himself and follow him. And I'll tell you, friends, it's, it can be hard sometimes to be a Christian, but it's much harder to serve the devil. Christianity costs something, but it pays a lot more than it costs. Amen. And so don't be afraid to say yes to Jesus and say, who wouldn't want to love a God and follow a God that loves us so much? Not just because it's better in this life, but he is offering us what? Everlasting life. God so loved the world he gave his son. That never meant quite as much to me as it did when I got a phone call one day that our son had died. Beautiful, handsome, talented, nice, strong son. No warning, your son is dead. And to think that God would willingly, and God, I can tell you, he loves his son infinitely more than any human loves their son. That he would give his son for us because he loves us that much, and you would say no to that love? Because of some sin, I can't think of what sin would be worth more than the Savior. You know, in a moment, we're going to sing our closing song. It's a happy song. But before we do, I just wonder, if there are some who are listening here, and you may respond at home, wherever you're listening, and you've heard the Lord speak to you today, and you want to say, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to surrender my life to you. And you'd be willing to stand in his presence right now, I want to have a special prayer for you. Some of you haven't done that before. Maybe you did it and you've wandered and you know you've not been bearing your cross. You know Jesus is coming soon and, and you want to be ready. Praise God. And I know some of us just want to renew that commitment and that's wonderful as well. Let me pray and then we're going to sing and we'll have a benediction. Loving Lord, we thank you for the promise that is all condensed in the story of the cross, that good news that Jesus died for all of our sins, that he gives us power to live a new life and a new heart, that we can be transformed because of that love. I pray that we might all experience that, Lord. Help us to hear you say, my son, my daughter, you will be with me in paradise and then determine to follow our Savior. We thank you and pray in his name. Amen. We're going to sing our, our theme song for this week. And don't forget, we've got the meetings that are coming again at 2 o'clock and through the remainder of the afternoon. Uh, God bless. By the way, the words are on the screen. They're not in your hymnal. <laughs>